right, I think it's time to um, kickstart the webinar. I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Mornay Christo. I'll be your host this evening, and I'm also the Dan Southern Africa CEO. Thank you for joining the webinar. I know that your time is valuable, and I hope that um, you'll find the webinar informative, and I also trust that you're doing well and that you're safe and healthy. So just a couple of uh, things. The talk topic this evening is uh, marine life hazards and management of injuries and uh, some basic housekeeping rules for the webinar. Uh, you'll find that you're muted and that your video is turned off for the webinar. And uh, please use the chat box to introduce yourself and tell us where you are in the world. And also let us know what you're expecting of the webinar this evening. Um, you can use the Q&A box to ask questions and please don't use the chat box to do so. Your questions might uh, get lost in, uh, in the process. Now the webinar replay will be available tomorrow via the Dan Southern Africa YouTube and Facebook channels. And please remember to stick around till the end of the webinar for the lucky draw. Now this evening, Dan will be the lucky draw uh, uh, prize sponsor. And the prizes are three of these Dan buffs. We've recently uh, produced them. You can see they're nice and red. It's nice stretchable material with the, um, the Dan logos on it. And uh, they also double up uh, to be, you know, to be used as masks in these COVID times. Um, our speaker this evening is Dr. Franz Cronier. I'll uh, introduce him in a little bit, but please stick around till the end of the webinar. Who knows, you might be one of the lucky draw winners. Now, just a little bit of a promotion for Dan. I'd like to thank uh, you for supporting Dan, the world's most recognized and respected dive safety organization that is comprised of dive professionals and medical experts dedicated to supporting divers. Now, as a Dan member, your membership fees provides you with essential dive emergency and trip cover, but also helps to support our research, medical services, educational programs, and global response initiatives. Um, Dan has created an extensive network capable of providing divers around the world with vital services. And every day, divers around the globe look to Dan as their dive safety organization. I'd like to thank you for being part of our community and supporting our efforts to make diving safe and incident free. If you are not a, a, a Dan member yet, why not join today by visiting our website, www.dansa.org or if you're in the America uh, area, dan.org, or within Europe, uh, daneurope.org. And if you're already a Dan member, make sure your membership is active uh, to continue enjoying the uh, benefits of being a Dan member. All right, so welcome to all the people who are joining by the uh, Facebook uh, live stream feed. It's great to have you on board. And let's meet our guest speaker, Dr. Franz Cronier. He is the founder of Dan Southern Africa, the former president and CEO, and a medical doctor with a passion for dive medicine, and uh, without a doubt, a scuba diver. Uh, so with that said, over to Dr. Franz Cronier, and I hope you're gonna enjoy the webinar. Thank you. things there are a lot of things in our environment that uh, can potentially cause problems underwater we know that but in reality it's only about two percent of uh, uh, injuries or calls through the hotline that we get that have anything to do with uh, hazardous marine life and even those are usually jellyfish stings and uh, uh, relatively minor rashes, uh, divers itch when an anemone larvae get in your, in your breaches, as it were. Uh, so those are the things we see, and the, and the really serious things are few and far between. So I don't want to paint a dismal picture. Um, perhaps I'd like to uh, invite you to look at the beauty of the uh, many of these organisms, although we should respect them, and uh, and that is uh, a big 
piece of the take-home message. Now, if we look at uh, hazardous marine life and we look at the way in which they can affect us, the easiest way to divide it is really into four core categories. Injuries, that's trauma. Allergy, we all know that. Toxicity, which uh, means that there's a venomous or a poisonous substance, and infection. And each of these can have primary and secondary effects. And what that means, just in fancy terms, is the injury, all right, your arm gets bitten. The secondary effect is that you bleed and you develop shock. Allergy, you uh, have your throat uh, swollen shut, which is the allergic response, and then having a lung overpressure injury as a result of breath holding that follows that. Toxicity, uh, causing paralysis, that's the primary effect. The secondary effect is not being able to breathe. And infection, if that's introduced, well, the infection can also produce secondary effects and affect other parts of our anatomy. So I'm going to run through these four just briefly, and then we'll look at the creatures that are representatives of uh, the, uh, the different categories and uh, what the core take-home messages are on each of these. So I'll start with allergies. Allergies, most of us are very familiar with allergies uh, on land, uh, food allergies, pollen allergies, grass, uh, um, horse hair, uh, cat hair, dog hair. Uh, but believe it or not, um, underwater, we are even more vulnerable to uh, allergic re responses. And ironically, in certain cases, uh, things like pollen can get into your dive cylinder. And we've had a case of a person developing an allergic response to pollen uh, from his dive cylinder. Now, that's very rare, but it just goes to show that this may, may happen. And the management is standard, and we'll get to that um, as we go through the various uh, uh, problems. Then there's toxicity. And here there's just a technical thing I want to point out. If it's something you take in by mouth, we refer to this, this uh, as a poison, this toxic substance as a poison. If it's introduced into the body in any other way, either by injection or through contact with the skin, we refer to it as a venom. So that is just a, a technical issue. Now, what are these venoms and what do they do? Well, these are all a lot of fancy words, but I, I want to say two things here before I just list uh, the various effects. And that is, one needs to remember that when marine life need to capture their quarry, which is their food as well, is many of these creatures are slower moving than their quarry. So you've got a cone shell, and it now needs to catch a fish. So it has to have a very rapid acting, very potent venom that will have an immediate effect so that it can make its way you know, to the paralyzed uh, fish so that it can enjoy a good lunch. And so for that reason, the, the venoms that we have in the marine environment are sometimes disproportionately uh, venomous, uh, toxic, and uh, they can curdle, which means break down protein. They can block signaling within the cells. They can cause itching, hurt, inflammation, clotting, bleeding, uh, stunt cell uh, reactions, cause short circuits within our nervous system, and of course, cause shock. So these are all, all the effects. Um, uh, and just a housekeeping thing, Mona, I can see you on the top of my screen. So if you wave at me, then, then I know that there's something that you want to say or do. Okay. So, so far, so good? Okay. All right. So if we look at our biology, there are two systems in the background, the so-called 
autonomic nervous system that we aren't even really aware of. And we can refer to them as the rest and digest versus the fight or flight response. And in the rest of, or, and digest, or if you like, squeeze and ooze, that's the things we do when we're relaxed. So that's when we think about eating and sleeping and doing all the other sort of fun things and uh, body maintenance. So that's the time of recovery. On the other hand, we have the pucker and panic side or the sympathetic side, which has to do with survival, has to do with dealing with stressful situations and um, uh, releasing or making all the resources possibly available to deal with whatever the threat is. When we're exposed to marine uh, venoms, uh, we need to realize that these two systems can become deranged. And they're not deranged individually. In other words, both sides of the autonomic nervous system can be affected. So you can have closure of um, the windpipe and you can have sweating and you can have raised blood pressure and uh, 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 congestion, et cetera, et cetera. So we just need to realize that these invisible and sometimes almost um, unconscious uh, systems in our body can be deranged significantly by marine venoms. The common way in which this happens, though, is that our batteries or nerve cells ultimately have a way of transmitting electrical signals that release a chemical substance, usually acetylcholine, that gets muscle cells, which are the most important in terms of movement, uh, to release calcium and in the process to contract and do the things that we need to do, to move, to kick, to fin, and to get around. So these venoms obviously interact with those particular avenues of, of action, be it the electrical impulse or the transfer of the chemical getting the muscle to work. And so it can over overstimulate or it can paralyze uh, depending on the unique uh, venom involved. The next is infection. Now, infection is, is not an unusual thing uh, on land, and, uh, and it's not an unusual thing underwater. And here you can see all a whole number of names that would make uh, a typical student of biology yawn, and I don't blame you if you do, but what I want to do, I want to point out, is that all those names that have little stars next to them are actually organisms we have on land as well. But there's a big difference. And the big difference we need to realize is that marine bacteria are in a brine solution. So they are pickled. And because they pickled, they are tough. And if we want to culture them, which is what we do when we study infections, we need to use a seawater-like environment to do so, failing which we may overlook that. And secondly, because they're so tough, we really need to get in with antibiotics that will take them out and that will overcome this thick barrier that they've put up to prevent um, uh, seawater from essentially uh, sucking them dry, as it were. So after saying that, I can reassure you that for minor abrasions, um, people usually have adequate immune systems, they don't need antibiotics, but if people are suffering from anything that causes immunocompromise, and you can see a whole list of conditions there that I won't get into, those individuals need help. And that is why we, we would not hesitate to then introduce antibiotics. And you might be interested to see that uh, tetracycline is one of them, 
And doxycycline is one of the antibiotics that we, in Africa at least, recommend for uh, the prophylaxis of malaria. And so that's sort of a two-for-one thing, uh, which is something just to keep in mind. It's tetracycline here, but doxycycline is, is of the same family. So be, be aware that even though you may think you don't have antibiotics for marine organisms, you may actually have simply because you've got uh, anti-malarial prophylaxis. So just bear that in mind. It's a resource people aren't always aware of. Now, once injuries are serious and they go to surgery, well, then it's inpatient or outpatient. Inpatient, you've got all the necessary uh, uh, interventions there, and we very, very quickly go for sophisticated and very strong antibiotics. The one advantage we have is that marine organisms haven't developed immunity as terrestrial organisms have, because terrestrial organisms have been used to antibiotics and they've developed uh, defenses, but that's not the case with marine organisms. So we hit them hard, we hit them fast, and, um, uh, and we get good results. And if it's an outpatient again, we can use fairly simple antibiotics and we get good results. Now, there are many infections that are relevant. I'm only going to mention one. This is common in people who handle fish, uh, are exposed to fish scales, maybe have little uh, cracks in their skin, or sometimes are stuck by just the barb of a, of a fish. It needn't be a toxic fish, and then develop this uh, erysipeloid, or which is essentially a, a creeping sort of red infection. Uh, this is an infection that responds readily to simple antibiotics like penicillin or erythromycin. So it's called fish handler's disease, or if you can pronounce it, erysipelothrix rusiopathiae, which is a fancy way of saying it's a nasty thing and it's red. We love these words uh, because they make us sound clever. Okay, now if you do choose to fall asleep, which I hope you won't, then this is the one slide I'd really like you to focus on because this is the summary that you can apply to all the hazardous marine life situations. The first priority is ABCs. You want to make sure that you, as the person providing help, that you're safe and that airway breathing and circulation remain the priorities. Uh, anything we do after those have failed is moot. So we need to make sure that airway breathing circulation is uh, supported and kept intact. And that may mean getting the person out of the water, away from the sharks and uh, in an area where you can provide additional support, stopping the bleeding. And here I just want to mention that thick towels do not work as a tourniquet. If you're going to go for tourniquets, get a proper professional tourniquet and mark the person with a Sharpie on the forehead, a T, indicating that this individual has a tourniquet in place. Because if you leave them on too long, then the tourniquet itself may become a bigger hassle. N neutralize the venoms or the poisons uh, to the extent that you can. And then you get into those four areas that I mentioned before. And you deal with them in the standardized way. And lastly, you deal with complications. And if I could leave one message with you is, if there is a relatively minor marine injury, the first scrubbing, cleaning, rinsing, washing that you do is the biggest investment uh, that you do overall in preventing secondary effects. So take time, rinse those uh, wounds, use soap, use chlorhexidine or antiseptics, make sure that those individuals have their wounds cleaned and realize that anything even up to a jellyfish can introduce Clostridium tetany, which causes tetanus. 
So tetanus is not just restricted to dog bites. You can get that related to marine organisms as well. Okay, so with that introduction, let's look at the perpetrators. What are the things, what are the creatures that we're concerned about when it comes to the underwater environment? Now, I love mnemonics, so I'm going to stick to S's here. And the first group are the snappers, the things that bite. Then you've got the stickers that have a barb. Oh, so, um, I'm sorry, the stingers that have a stinging cell. The stickers that have a barb. The scrapers that cause a contact-related just abrasion. You have the shockers. And you have, well, I was, I was desperate, so snackers. You know, you eat things that uh, are potentially harmful to you. And they affect you in the various ways that I've listed here. I'm going to start off with the snappers. And you can see here that there are a number of familiar creatures. And what they all have in common, looking at this display of the various creatures, animals, plants, um, and bacteria or microorganisms, the creatures that cause traumatic injuries need to have enough bones and spinal cords and teeth to actually do something. So you're looking at mammals, reptiles, bony fish, and cartilaginous fish like sharks, because they need to have the wherewithal in order to bite you. Uh, if we consider these creatures, the ones that we tend to think of first are sharks, but in truth, we have far more boating injuries causing harm than we have shark bites. So let's just put it in perspective. Secondly, out of 350 species of sharks, only 32 are potentially dangerous, of which the most dangerous ones are, lift, are listed there, the great white mako, bull shark, and so on. Sharks are an enormous range of creatures going from grams to tons. And only a hundred attacks. Now, of course, a hundred is very relevant to the people who are affected, but throughout the world, there are only about a hundred attacks of which 10%, one in 10, are fatal. So it is really an overemphasized issue, but it is an issue nonetheless. And when we consider that and looking at Mornay's t shirt that he was displaying just now, with, uh, with the great white on it, yes, you've got a creature of which the largest of which I know is nine meters, three tons, and a biting force. And just to give you a sense of what it is, a biting force of the equivalent of 1,200 bar. So if you were to blast 1,200 bar on a square centimeter, that's the biting force of a great white shark. And they found all over the world. Now, uh, sharks aren't typically uh, uh, interested in humans, but they are creatures that go for particular type of prey and humans dressed in wetsuits or on paddle boards or in some sort of gear that resemble uh, uh, a, an ordinary marine uh, source of food to great whites uh, is likely to be vulnerable uh, to, or not likely, but is potentially going to be vulnerable to attack. And what you saw there is a phenomenon that we see in False Bay here in the Cape uh, uh, quite readily, which is actually sort of a breaching of the shark in catching a seal. But those are, those are really cool things to show, but we really shouldn't overemphasize those issues. What we do need to know is that, yes, there can be tissue loss. Yes, there can be bleeding. Yes, uh, obviously, if you have your head bitten off, then, you know, survival is, uh, is not likely. Um, and that there is a high risk of infection. 
and uh, that sharks don't maintain particular good dental hygiene. So infections are a big piece of managing these injuries. And the injuries can be graphic. And I don't want to overemphasize that. We all recognize that that is potentially there. And our focus should be on keeping people alive, stopping the bleeding, and not because hysteria often breaks out when shark attacks uh, occur, that we don't move people prematurely, that we do as much as we can to stabilize them where they are and ideally get sophisticated medical help to them where they are rather than moving them to sophisticated care. Now, I realize in remote regions that is simply not always possible. But that is the lesson that we learned the hard way uh, when there were a lot of shark attacks on the KwaZulu-Natal coast, that if you move these people prematurely, you often do uh, more harm than good. So stopping the bleeding and getting them stabilized is a tremendous investment. Now, there are lots of fish that have a lot of teeth. And uh, barracudas aren't everywhere in the world, but they've got impressive teeth. And they're basically your neighborhood dogs. They just happen to be submerged. And if they do bite you, they uh, obviously are gonna cause damage and it's typically going to be the hand or, or the extremities that are going to be bitten and need to be managed appropriately and surgically by people that, uh, that know what they're doing. Crocodiles, we're not strangers to those in Africa, certainly. A lot of people um, succumbing to crocodiles in, in the Nile River, etc. Um, alligators, if you're in Florida and China, then you might be concerned about alligators. Everywhere else, it's a crocodile. And uh, the creatures should not be underestimated. They uh, are dangerous. They are territorial. They have a very sophisticated social structure and they actually are really good at planning stealth attacks. Um, they definitely are known to eat humans, so we need to uh, just be aware of that. Um, and um, you don't want to do stupid things. Um, uh, you stay away from walking near river banks where there are crocodiles, estuaries, or camping uh, near riverbanks where they're crocodiles. And, uh, you know, there are really stupid things about to do. And the point here is just to show that the crocodile rolls usually in the process of drowning their victim and then finishing them off later. As an extension of the crocodiles and uh, just the propensity of marine creatures to bite us, one of the things that we do that really does not serve us well, although it's very entertaining, is to feed fish or to feed moray eels. It's all very well when you feed them, but when they get accustomed to food and you disappoint them, then uh, they, may, they may choose you as the next best thing. So be wise in terms of uh, how you go about this. And as an extension of the feeding issue, we have a very interesting situation in, in our coastline at least, and that is that you have this funny marriage of convenience between moray eels and crayfish. Now crayfish are sought after by underwater uh, hunters, breath hole divers, and octopus eat crayfish. Moray eels, on the other hand, eat octopus. So this is a wonderful marriage because if the octopus is after the crayfish, the moray eel has a free meal. So this, this is a really useful thing uh, for them. The, the problem is when we try and catch crayfish because then we may become attached to a moray eel in a way that we would prefer not to. And moray eels have two sets of teeth. What you're seeing here are the visible teeth that can bite and let go. 
But behind those, illustrated more clearly here, are a second set of teeth. You can just make them out over here. And those teeth, once they've bitten, they stay locked. And the only way to release that is to cut off the head of the moray eel. So that's just one of the things that uh, people don't generally know. Okay, where the bites occur are obviously typically the hands and uh, taking care of hands surgically requires people that know what they're doing because you can have long-term de de debilitating uh, uh, functional loss if it's not managed adequately. So um, treat these with respect and uh, get the best possible uh, surgeon to deal with that. And uh, just to, to break the pace here, Mornay, I'm going to give you a moment to just step in here because I know you've got a couple of things that you'd like to share as well. So we have dealt with the snappers, and now we're going to the stingers. So what we're looking at here are essentially creatures that are armed with a specific stinging cell or stinging apparatus that allows them to, uh, to capture uh, a relatively, in some cases, relatively larger prey than they themselves are, such as anemones uh, that are able to do that. And they all fall in this area over here called the cnidaria, which is killing cells. And they're made up of a whole host of so-called salenterates. And these salenterates are familiar to you. Portuguese man of war, sea wasps, sea anemones, all of these fall into this category, but out of the 9,000 species, only about 100 are actually dangerous to us. The business end of them, though, is the stinging cell. And I'm next going to show you a video clip that is just going to show you how the barb can be released when it's stimulated either by touch or by low osmo low osmolar uh, fluids, in other words, fresh water on an organism that is used to seawater. That's actually a stimulant that actually will discharge the nematocyst. But without further ado, here's the video clip. The tentacles are covered with millions of microscopic stinging capsules called nematocysts that are triggered the instant they're touched. Each capsule fires a tube that penetrates flesh, releasing the deadly venom from the sides, and it all happens at lightning speed. So that's what a nematocyst does. And um, this is an extreme example uh, of the uh, box jellyfish, which is found on the east coast of Australia. And uh, this individual is six months in. So these scars can sometimes be lifelong and the treatment should be very aggressive, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but perhaps just to dispel one of the myths, because one of the treatments for uh, uh, jellyfish, uh, jellyfish stings has been alcohol. Um, and uh, this is just to show this, by the way, is a, um, a tentacle, if you like, with a whole host of nematocysts. And what you see here, is all the individual darts that have been released in response to uh, being treated with methylated spirits. So, no, it's not a good idea to treat them with alcohol, whereas, on the other hand, these are the same tentacles treated with vinegar. And what happens, they shrivel and don't discharge, and that is why on the east coast of Australia in particular, 
they have copious amounts of uh, vinegar available. And uh, this is the first line treatment for jellyfish stings in general. Okay, the effects of the venom, as you might imagine, it's a whole Pandora's box because these creatures need to eat what they can get. So they essentially have venoms that have a very wide range of incapacitating um, proteins. And the important thing to remember as far as you are concerned is that it's going to be painful, irritating, burning, itching, and may cause allergies. In the serious uh, cases of nematocysts, um, such as Portuguese man of war to some extent, or box jellyfish, one needs to be really, really careful when individuals are still wrapped with tentacles, because if you want to rinse them off the individual or get them off the individual, use seawater, or at least three times normal saline, which is what that is, and that's 9%. Uh, sodium chloride in water and the reason for that is if you use fresh water you will discharge every single stinging cell so you don't want to use fresh water when a person is still in contact with nematocysts so that's when a person is involved on the other hand when you're dealing with equipment equipment will basically be rendered free of any active um, nematocysts if it's rinsed in fresh water. So when people are involved, seawater. If equipment is involved, fresh water. And one of the most effective pain relieving agents is Emla cream. And uh, the general approach is that initially you deal with the pain and, and after that you deal with the inflammation, which is where uh, topical steroids come in. Now, this is something that we see in South Africa, which is called uh, by various names. There's a famous wreck off the KZN coast called the, the, uh, the produce, and uh, it's affectionately called produce kiss. And what it is, is these little beautiful fern-like fern -like, uh, hydroids, which when they're in contact with your hand or glove, will not uh, uh, penetrate the skin. But what happens upon removing the mask is that the tender skin of the, of the face is affected. And it can be treated once again with vinegar and eventually steroids. Same principle as before. More familiar, Portuguese man of war or blue bottle, its venom is 20 times more potent than cobra venom. It causes a whole host of responses, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and things that could be confused with food poisoning. Uh, but the people will have the telltale signs of tentacle impressions. And that's just one of the things to be aware of. And if, if uh, people have had significant uh, stings or they've been in, in a whole colony of these Portuguese man of war, they can really get into dire straits. To warn you just that these uh, tentacles can reach uh, five meters or more and that they can remain alive on the beach for about two weeks. So beachcombing kids that play with these can get very nasty stings. So just be aware of that. Um, and, uh, and warn uh, your, your, your kids. This is the most venomous creature in the sea, the box jellyfish, which fortunately only occurs in Australia, and it basically stops your heart, and uh, I think the shortest uh, time it has taken to kill an individual is 15 seconds. So they are very, very toxic, and in fact, a life savers when people pull back in response to uh, being stung because it's very painful, they immediately respond and uh, they uh, get the person out of the water before they drown and treat them with vinegar, copious amounts of vinegar and 
try and uh, neutralize as much venom as possible and even use anti-venom because the anti-venom helps in, in uh, avoiding the scarring which you saw earlier. Okay, so that's snappers, stingers, now we're with stickers. And in stickers, we've got the vertebrates and we've got invertebrates. So we've got the sort of fishy things and we've got the sea urchin-y things. And, uh, and uh, as you'll see, the octopus, which uh, is Mornay is sporting beautifully behind his, uh, uh, his, uh, 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 his picture uh, that he's uh, showing. So let's just go through these quickly. Basically, the whole scorpion fish family are uh, venomous. So all of them have dorsal spines that if they penetrate the skin, release venom. And what I was showing you here with this video clip is not sterling behavior, but basically illustrating foolishness. That is exactly what you shouldn't be doing with these fish. You stay away from them because they can inflict significant um, uh, envenomations that are very painful. And the important thing to remember about these is that marine venoms in general, because the oceans don't heat up much higher than about 30 degrees centigrade, most of these venoms are neutralized by 45 degrees centigrade water. So if you've ever climbed in, into a bath and you've said, hoo, 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 well, that, that's just too hot. Well, that's just about what you're talking about. That's 45 degrees centigrade. It's just a little bit warmer than you'd want to run your bath. Okay, we're not talking about boiling water because then the boiling is going to be worse than the actual injury. And the way in which it's usually provided is that between 15 to 30 minutes, the, the limb or the foot or whichever part of the body is, or hot packs can be used um, is treated for, for uh, uh, 15 minutes to really alleviate the sting. And then the individual usually starts complaining about the, <laughs> the heat. And then when that's taken away, well, then the heat of the sting comes back and then you put the hot pack back in, in, in place. And that goes on and off, on and off, on and off about uh, six times or so. And after that, it's usually manageable. Untreated, uh, it can be a, a good 24 hours that the person will remember having been envenomated. So respect them. And the same with stingrays. The classic way in which the stingray is uh, really stimulated is where individuals fiddle with them. And you see on this video clip, what happened there, and I'll just play that back a little bit. What you're seeing here is a reflexive whipping of the tail. And if this individual were just a little bit closer, they would have gone the same way Steve Irwin did. That those spines can be large enough to go straight into the lungs, straight into the heart, and they can cause instantaneous death. So you want to be mindful and respectful of these creatures. Typically, it's the limbs that would be envenomated. And what I want to point out here is that in many cases, we want x-rays or ultrasound because you don't pick up the remnants of the barbs uh, uh, with a naked eye. And these wounds tend to fester indefinitely until all foreign material has been removed. So please bear that in mind. Okay, stingray treatment. We've basically already discussed the general approach and the general approach applies here as for the other stingers. Okay, sea, sea snakes. Well, there are 52 species. They're all venomous. And I don't know about you, but after many years of diving, I can count on my two hands the number of sea snakes I've seen. They really are very, very shy. So you need to be highly motivated to be bitten by a sea snake. 
because they, their fangs are really not designed to bite humans and they are not likely to do so. They're very shy creatures generally. But if they do bite you, um, you have about six hours to know whether you've got really big problems or not. Within six hours, you'll either be paralyzed or you got bitten by a bunch of blanks. The teeth uh, didn't release uh, the venom. So be respectful of uh, these creatures. They can inflict harm, but typically don't. And then the sea urchins. The sea urchins, we've got a whole bunch here. I want to point out the crown of thorns, which is probably the worst, which has destroyed areas of the Great Barrier Reef. Again, hot water being uh, the, the treatment of choice. The long spine sea urchin, which you see over here, again, it releases a, its toxin. But what I want to point out here is that you can see these little dots here. Now, spines penetrated these areas, but the barbs weren't left. The pigment was. In other words, the sort of dark discoloration of those spicules was actually embedded, like a tattoo, but the barbs are gone. And that is frequently the case. If there are symptoms as a result of the toxin, then hot water is the treatment of choice, but we don't necessarily need to go further than that. This is a, a little boy, this is in fact my hand. Uh, this is a child that stuck um, their hand into a tidal pool and got uh, uh, um, sea urchin spines essentially tattooing their fingers over there. Whereas this individual has a spine lodged in a joint in the hand and that needs to be surgically removed. Okay, so that's the range that one may encounter. These short spine sea urchins we see uh, uh, in the colder waters, and they are really a sign of a healthy coastline. So if you see these short spine sea urchins, you know it's a healthy coastline. If you are unfortunate enough to have more than 10 spines uh, being lodged in your hand or wherever you got stuck, well, then the body lodges a foreign body reaction and you can sometimes develop granules which are treated with cortisone. Then see cucumbers. Now, these are not the sort of creatures that are going to uh, lay in wait and pounce on you. The way a sea cucumber is going to cause a problem, that is if you don't eat it, because it is a delicacy in some parts of the world, is on reefs that in the tidal changes actually become exposed. Sometimes uh, the uh, sea cucumbers can be on the reefs and people walk on the reefs and as they step on them, uh, the uh, sea cucumber literally will release its uh, uh, venom uh, on the individual. And the only real problem is if it ends up in the eye because it is a cause of blindness. And um, when you think you've irrigated the eye sufficiently, irrigate it for another 30 minutes, because you need to be really aggressive in protecting the person's vision, because it is uh, a very serious threat to individual's vision. Sponges, well, of course, we know them as uh, bathroom accessories. In the olden days, they used to use the actual creature, but only once the creature itself had left and the skeleton remained. If you touch a live sponge, then it actually has these spicules, and they can cause very, very nasty blistering. And how you get rid of them is by using uh, uh, packing tape or cello tape and vinegar. And remember, once again, like any of these creatures that uh, if you haven't had your booster for tetanus um, it's something that you should always keep in mind with any of these injuries 
Okay, now mollusks. Mollusks we know in terms of shells, shellfish, and um, the octopus, as I said, that Mornay was sporting so beautifully behind him. The one that we are most concerned about is called Conus geographicus, and there is no part of this shell that you can hold it that it will not be able to reach. So these are shells that should be avoided and certainly respected. And I'm going to show you in a little while a video clip um, that just shows you, I'm going to move back just briefly here, uh, to say that you've got about six hours after you've been envenomated to know whether or not you are going to get into trouble. And uh, just to show you how aggressive these creatures can be, what you're looking at here is a fish. This is a cone shell. And this yellow thing over there, that is the radula or the barb. This has been slowed down a hundred times. And what you're going to see is it taking its meal. The barb goes into the fish and it's dragged into its mouth. And now you can appreciate why the venoms are so important because you can't have a flailing fish. Uh, that's going to give them a bit of a stomach ache for a while. And that cone shell is good for a week. <laughs> they uh, won't need another meal for a week at least. But I hope that just shows you the power and uh, the virulence of these creatures. Okay, so now the blue ringed octopus. The blue ringed octopus has in its uh, salivary glands, the glands that release moisture when it eats, actually contain a poison that is similar to puffer fish poisoning. The bite itself, which you're seeing over there, is not painful. But then within four to 12 hours, the person can become completely paralyzed. And what we do then is we just need to keep them alive. We just need to keep them breathing. We need to keep the heart beating. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, the venom essentially works its way out because there is no specific antidote. And heat, in this case, does not work. Tetraodotoxin and blue ring ox, uh, octopus um, toxin is not uh, vulnerable to heat. So heat's not going to work for that. We're nearly done. Uh, the scrapers, anything, this is shark skin, anything with an abrasive surface has the capacity to uh, cause um, a wound, and with a wound comes the potential for infection, so please remember to clean those. Shockers, you can get those in fresh and in seawater. What you're looking at over here is a partially hidden electric ray, and it's got two organs on both sides of the spinal cord, and it can release a 220 volt shock, which is basically the same as the energy we use when we uh, apply a uh, defibrillator to a person's chest. So these are <laughs> creatures to be respected. I don't know of any deaths that have occurred as a result of the shocks, but I do know of people that have, a, that have certainly given very vivid descriptions of being uh, shocked. So with all that in mind, what should you have in your kit? you're not going to remember all of this. So I'm going to point out a couple of things and then encourage you to look at these slides again at your leisure and we'll make the slides available to you as well. You want adrenaline because if a person has an acute, or epinephrine, has an acute allergic reaction, that's what's going to keep them alive. Just like with bee stings, you want an EpiPen. You want to have antihistamines, you want to have cortisone, you want to have things for pain, 
and the topical cream that works best is Emla, if you can get that. And remember, tetanus toxoid. Apart from that, it's basically acetic acid, vinegar, and then all the things that we would use to remove barbs and close wounds. But those would usually be used by uh, health professionals. The one thing I want to point out is that if you are a rescuer assisting a person who has been stung, you want to put on uh, one or preferably two sets of gloves to make sure that you don't become a victim yourself. So that's just something to bear in mind. Very few areas in the world have sufficient quantities of envenomations or sea snake bites uh, to justify having antivenoms. My guess is where you're going to be, it won't be available. And you'll need to resort to the basic first aid measures uh, and treatment measures that uh, I've mentioned before. And just to close off the snackers, well, here we're looking at, and I'll go through them very briefly, we're looking at those that are acquired, and with acquired, I mean those that actually come from plankton, and those that come from rotting. Now, the ones that come from plankton, mixed plankton over here, what happens is you get upwelling, you get what are called hazardous algae blooms, which is only a partially correct term, but they exhaust the oxygen and then they die off. And that's known typically as red tide. And mussel or any filter feeding shellfish, if they absorb this toxin, they become toxic. They don't die themselves, but they become toxic. And it takes only three muscles. This is red tide following a hazardous algae bloom. It only takes three muscles to kill an adult human male. And the mortality is about uh, between 1% and 10%. So almost like shark attack. So it's not trivial. And you need to know and ask the locals whether there have been recent hazardous algae blooms because it takes at least six months before the filter feeders have actually expelled the toxin. So trust the locals and get advice from the locals. Ciguatera poisoning, interestingly enough, occurs when you blow up tropical reefs. The invasion of Mauritius originally by the, uh, the British was held off because they um, uh, destroyed parts of the reef to try and uh, uh, land their ships and in doing so released the poison that went up the food chain and when the sailors eventually ate the larger fish they got such severe poisoning that they eventually had to retreat. And it took another 50 years before they tried again. Ciguatera poisoning is not poisonous to the fish, but it is poisonous to you. And not only does it cause an initial problem that may affect the spinal cord and brain, in co uh, including paralysis, but it may actually last for years. And people may even find, funnily enough, when they eat chicken that has been fed on fish meal, that they have a recurrence of their symptoms. Crazy, but true. Okay, so this is where we want to end, isn't it? We want to avoid the injuries. So how do we do that? Buoyancy control, be aware, look up and around, shuffle your feet, because the fish will move away, this, the stingrays will move away if given the chance. Wear thick cell boots or fins, avoid carrying speared fish, streamline your body. The last thing you want is your submerged pressure gauge,
dangling over a fish and irritating it so that it stings you. Know what's in the in, uh, environment and get advice from the locals. Have a proper first aid kit. Wear appropriate exposure protection, including, including uh, lycra suits, and be passive. Most marine creatures are not naturally aggressive, and if you're passive, they will retreat. Avoid using the reef to stabilize yourself, putting your hands down uh, on the reef to try and just keep your buoyancy. Don't pick up the beautiful uh, shells that you see because they may still contain an owner that's venomous. And well, your decision about raw fish, that's every person's choice, but it has its hazards and you know about that now. So that brings us to the end of this presentation and um, I'd be very happy uh, to take questions now. I'm going to stop share sharing my screen here and uh, Mornay, back to you if you could just uh, guide the questions there. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cronier. Um, uh, lots to think about. And uh, as you said, I'm sure many of the people attending would like to have the slides. I'll make those available. And obviously with a replay amongst uh, many other things. So the email uh, that I'll send out and even um, uh, the notes that I'll put into the uh, replay links via Facebook and YouTube will include uh, the links to the slides. Uh, we've got a fantastic uh, hazardous marine life uh, guide or handbook that we'll make available free of charge to you to all the folks um, and I'll also make uh, links available to our uh, hazardous marine life or first aid for hazardous marine life course so there's a nice treat for you you can go through the uh, the theory part and if you'd like to get qualified um, we've got a couple of Dan instructors around uh, the world obviously or more than a couple but in particular we actually have Russell Opland who's a Dan uh, instructor or instructor trainer so he's on on, on the call and uh, if ever you want to get in touch I'll put you in touch with them as well and then obviously I'll share a whole bunch of other things like the alert divers our um, um, the annual uh, diving incident report and many, many other things. But um, let me leave that. I'd like to um, uh, maybe just address some of the questions. Uh, Russell Opland has got three. And um, I see Gregory Dressel's also got uh, another one. Greg Gregory is, in fact, one of our uh, instructor trainers as well. So great to see them on board. And if anybody else has questions, please uh, make use of the Q&A um, box to do so. So let me uh, start with the first question here, Dr. Cronier. Russell uh, asks, uh, with respect to marine organisms, how likely is some sort of uh, inhaled infection via your BCD or oral inflator or more likely a rebreather, the loop, or uh, counter lungs uh, to occur, I guess. Um, so I don't know if that's, that's possible. I guess the goodies getting it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a, a fascinating question. In fact, even red tides can be aerosolized. You know, if you have wind blowing over red tides, there have been episodes where, where the uh, venom has actually been aerosolized and that has caused uh, uh, problems okay. directly with the venom. But to answer your question, most marine um, uh, organisms, as I mentioned, are vulnerable to, uh, to fresh water. So if you, if you wash with fresh water, then you will have killed off most of them. And um, if you then use the, the, the usual uh, uh, equipment, recommended uh, cleaning agents, then it should take care of those. Okay. So that's a, that's a fairly simple and shallow answer, but I think that uh, that bears the, the, the core ingredients. Mm. Fresh water is, is a good way of getting rid of um, uh, marine organisms, and then the uh, equipment manufacturer's advice on maintenance uh, should be applied in in maintaining the equipment well great question and also great answer you know i think sometimes uh keeping things simple 
is the better way to go, you know, but uh, also understanding how it needs to be applied is, is great. So Russell has another question and it's uh, with regards to shark bites. So he says, is icing a limb subjective to shark bites for purposes of uh, vasoconstriction going to be helpful? Uh, that's uh, an interesting theoretical question. There are a number of things that are a problem as far as that's concerned, uh, because shark bites are usually uh, are usually fairly significant and usually involve uh, very large arteries, and those arteries are less likely to respond to uh, to ice. In other words, it's it's going to be too little. If, if it's a really a trivial shark bite, perhaps one could think of that. But uh, by and large, a shark bite involves larger blood vessels than ice would be able to, uh, to vasoconstrict. But I, I, I like the way you, you're thinking about that and, and applying that. So thank you for that question. Yeah, very interesting. Um, Russell's got another question, but I'm just going to skip ahead one or two and I'll get back to his. Um, Gregory Dressel wants to know how long does a text tox, uh, or how long does a text tox shot last? Okay, um, 10 years. Okay. So basically every 10 years you should have a booster. Okay, all right, well there we go. Um, and then uh, we got Carl and Naomi from a call they down your part of the world, Dr. Crenier in uh, Cape Town. Um, he says the cone shell in Cape Town well, the cone shells in Cape Town, are they also as dangerous? Uh, um, what did he say? Do you know if it's cone? Oh, okay, well, uh, anyways, he just wants to know the cone shells down in Cape Town, if, uh, you know, do they also apply? Or yes, good, excellent question. Australia is a fascinating um, a situation in which its terrestrial creatures are fairly benign. They've got almost no predators, uh, whereas underwater they've got the most horrendous creatures <laughs> when it comes to, to uh, stickers and, and stingers and so on. Uh, but to answer your question, the Conus geographicus is clearly the most toxic, but all cone shells do have potential, um, uh, you know, introduce uh, venom into the individual. But uh, to my knowledge, there have been, if so, about five cases of lethal uh, cone shell envenomations in South Africa, to the best of my knowledge. But people like Cleve Robertson and people from the NSRI and so on may actually have, have even better statistics on that. The, the take-home message on a cone shell, though, is don't put it in your pocket and realize that there's no place on a cone shell that you can hold hold it where its radula cannot reach. That's a very, very important point. Uh, sorry for that. I said it's the first time I saw that uh, or video that you showed of the, uh, the cone shell. I mean, it's amazing how flexible that uh, um, that part is, I guess. So um, there was a question uh, right at the start of the uh, the webinar via Facebook, um, asking what are your thoughts on um, uh, what's um, oh, geez now I forget the word. Let me just get it quickly. One of the worms um, with all the hairs on fireworms. Yes, yes, because he's actually I think he's based or diving in Croatia, and he says on the reefs they become quite a um, a bit of a, a hassle because they're eating up quite a lot of the uh, the coral life, uh, including the uh, sea stars, you know. But I know that they are quite venomous, especially if those hairs get onto you. So yeah. I don't know if you have anything to say about that, uh, Dr. Cronier. Well, um, I don't have a formulated thought on that. Avoiding it clearly is, is the best thing to do and wearing the necessary protection um, uh, I'll also answer with a, um, uh, you know, a, a situation where I was humbled when um, I had uh, a sea, sea lice, or, or, or sea lice, I think it was sea lice that, uh, that was singing me. And um, I was going on talking about that, yes, vinegar, 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 vinegar. 
and the person on the on the the skip on the boat said just try tannic acid and after a long discussion and poo pooing i put uh, I, his advice to use and after three sprays i had no more pain okay and uh, i don't know whether i was more grateful about the pain relief than uh, i was concerned about the amount of blushing i did uh, <laughs> as a result of that so uh, getting back to your specific question, um, the, the venom involved is very likely to be heat uh, sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there's no reason to think that it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be uh, a very, uh, it, it would be something that I would recommend you prepare for. And other than that, um, in, in certain cases, the bristles can be removed by adhesive tape. But um, uh, I, would, I would actually, it's something I, I'll actually look up. Thank you for asking that. Uh, I want to give you a proper, proper answer okay. because I think it is deserving. And if you would please, in your email, um, and please address it uh, uh, to us, please give us the, the full scope of... Um, uh, you know, the challenges you face, because we, we'd like to give you answers. I mean, that's what mm. Dan is all about. Okay. So thank you for that question. So um, uh, back to uh, Russell's question. He wants to know for nematocysts, uh, does it matter if it's red or white vinegar? And does urine work uh, in the absence of vinegar? <laughs> yeah, there's always the urine question. And, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the sort of the tongue-in-cheek answer is it should be fresh and preferably your own. Yeah, <laughs> but um, the the what it speaks to is that fresh water run uh, carries the risk of discharging more nematocysts. Yeah. So uh, um, urine does not have particularly therapeutic properties other than not being fresh water. Mm. So uh, um, that really is is the primary uh, answer. And secondly, red or white vinegar, it doesn't really make a significant difference. It is uh, uh, largely the pH, uh, so the acidity that has the primary effect. And it doesn't seem to matter whether it's grape or artificially uh, um, synthesized uh, vinegar. Mm. Good question. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, in fact, uh, Adele uh, asked a similar question, which you've answered now. So... Um, I'm going to skip over that one. Uh, we've got anonymous. Uh, if someone has had an anaphylactic uh, response to trace amounts of uh, indigest or um, eating shellfish, is there any risk of the, this happening when diving uh, with full exposure suit and gloves, etc.? Uh, maybe I read that wrong. Don't know if you can maybe. Put uh, it no, I think it's that's a great question. The the allergy to to um, Shellfish is often associated with allergy to iodine, um, but the, the the transfer of vulnerability to um, to shellfish while diving, um, I, I am unaware of any cases that have been reported where the anaphylaxis related to eating them uh, is um, uh, carried over to diving. Mm. So um, the short answer is, to the best of my knowledge, the answer is no. Okay. Um, we have a, a, another question uh, from Andre, and he wants to know the um, uh, text talk shot. Is that the same as a tetanus shot? Yes. What, what usually happens at a young age, um, there's, there's a whole series of vaccines, and I know there, there's a lot of talk about vaccination, but... Um, a tetanus toxoid is usually introduced very early in the um, in the series of vaccinations that people get, and then after that, there is a generalized recommendation that one should get a tetanus uh, booster, not a full shot, but a booster shot, okay. um, at least every five to ten years. Mostly in uh, casualty units, they will be on the conservative side, meaning they, or aggressive side, I suppose it would be, in rather giving a tetanus booster at that stage than not. 
Um, but it is wise before taking a, 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 a trip into a remote location to consider getting your tetanus uh, status checked and uh, getting a tetanus booster uh, if necessary. There are excellent recommendations uh, on the CDC website and uh, various other travel medicine websites that deal with vaccinations in particular. Because there are certain uh, vaccinations, for instance, um, against um, a, a typhoid and so on, that, that are not very effective and only really recommended under particular exposure situations. So it's, it's really important to get good advice when it comes to either the forms of inoculation or vaccination or immunization, because those involve different strategies. Great question. Thank you. Indeed, indeed. So, um, uh, uh, you know, two or three more questions to go. Uh, again, Carl and Naomi from, um, from Cape Town. So he says in Cape Town, there's a box jellyfish. And is it also as bad as the one from uh, Australia? And he said he's had some bad experience with it. With it. He's taken some uh, allergic uh, tablets and cream, and that didn't help at all. And then he used the heat pack, and that seemed to be the best treatment. And uh, he's saying that it was extremely painful or super painful to put the heat on the wound. Yes, the, uh, uh, the, the answer is um, in terms of the Chironex fleckery, which is the, the, the true box jellyfish, um, it is lethal mm -hmm. and um, uh, vinegar is readily available, whereas heat typically is not. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, uh, it simply is a, has been a matter of practicality of having that available uh, with the lifesavers on at the uh, east coast of Australia. But I absolutely agree with you, like all marine venoms, um, not, not the poisons, but the venoms, uh, uh, they are heat sensitive. And 45 degrees centigrade, which is pretty much as hot as can be born uh, or can be tolerated, is the heat that uh, you would use. And uh, the rule of thumb is if the pain from the barb or the sting is worse than the pain inflicted by the heat of the water, then the water's too hot. Mm. Okay. Great answer. Well, Carl, I hope that helps. And uh, yeah, I, I haven't been stung by any marine uh, animal, so I can't say what that feels like, but I have been part of the treatment in many cases when I was still in Mozambique, and quite often, to be quite honest, um, um, it's not due to bad behavior on the diver's part. It's quite often just accidental, and one example was we were diving um, on a reef, it was just beautiful that day, it was clear, and all of a sudden there was this surge that started coming in, and it bumped or it moved a diver onto the reef because there was a ledge, and unfortunately we had those very inquisitive lionfish following us around, and unfortunately he got squeezed up against that and got zapped on the uh, forearm. Oh, and I mean, that chap was in pain for exactly as you're saying, that sort of four hour period. We had the heat packs and everything, but yeah, it was, um, was bad. Uh, anyways, uh, another great question from Andre. He wants to know what is the best number to call for assistance or help in relation to treatment in case of an emergency in South Africa? So I think the best part, uh, most probably as a diver, uh, or even if you're not a diver and you happen upon, um, uh, something like this is to um, call the Dan emergency hotline and we got two numbers uh, there's the 0800 020 111 which is toll free uh, within South Africa and I'll send the message so that everybody can see it uh, but the best number to really save in your phone because as divers we tend to travel around I know internationally now it's it's not that easy but um, it's the mobile number which is plus two seven eight two eight ten sixty ten and I'll hit the send button now Andre and hopefully everybody else will be able to see that as well um, another question that came by the chat uh, box it's from Mike 
Uh, he wants to know, how does fire coral venom work? Or is it uh, thousands of hairs doing the damage? That's a fascinating question because fire coral has a very unique, um, uh, let's call it evolution, in as far as, uh, I mean, it, it does have nematocyst-like cells, but what, uh, what is found is that there seems to be a sort of two-week cycle. In other words, for some reason, unless the initial wound is cleaned very, very thoroughly, uh, individuals tend to get a recurrence of their symptoms in, in sort of two-week cycles for sometimes two or even three periods. Yeah. And, uh, and to be perfectly honest, we're not quite sure why that is the case. Um, but I would, again, encourage you, please send me an email and I'll give you, uh, I'll get you a proper answer to that. Um, but as far as the practicalities are concerned, uh, the initial cleaning is essential. And, uh, and again, uh, the, the treatment with heat is appropriate. And um, the, the two-week cycle is not unusual, as is a spread of uh, the pain to the local lymph glands which uh, is sometimes uh, common with the uh, fire coral. Great question. Yeah, in indeed. And um, for the folks that registered via um, the Zoom platform, you'll receive a mail tomorrow. And I'll also add uh, the, the mail or the email address we use for these medical type questions. And I'll give it to you now. It's danmedic at danSA.org. And um, I've also shared that via the Facebook uh, comments for the folks um, uh, viewing via the live stream so that they can also engage with us there. And then for the General Dan members, I'll also send out a mail with the replay link and I'll also add that in and, uh, you know, so that we can um, ask those questions. Uh, Dr. Cronier, are you up for some more questions or have we exhausted you? Sure. All right, no. great stuff. So we have Rian here, also with a, quite, uh, a very interesting question relating to, you know, the stings, jellyfish, blue bottles, and so forth, I assume. It says, um, or he asks, uh, it has been suggested to mix dental and vinegar in a solution of two and one or two to one. Um, do you know about this? Is it helpful to disinfect and neutralize, I, I assume, the stings? Well, the nematocyst. Yeah. Um, the principle behind it is excellent. Uh, I certainly haven't seen studies uh, showing whether it is superior, you know, to just using the vinegar. Uh, I, I would, I would simply extrapolating from principle say that in the initial situation, you are dealing with um, the toxicity issue. And at that stage, the concentration and acidity of the vinegar is critical. Mm. Um, and then in terms of the secondary effects, you're dealing with the uh, complications of infection. Mm. So I think if you, ha if you had a choice of only having one solution, then something, you know, one solution as in one mixture, then I think that would be a very sensible approach. Um, but I would, uh, I would rather err on the side of having the, the protein denaturating concentrated vinegar uh, as the antidote or at least the, the toxin destructive, destructive uh, component, which the chlorhexidine wouldn't do. And the infection will only set, set will, will only develop uh, over the course of the ensuing days. Mm. So you have minutes when it comes to the venom and you've got days when it comes to the uh, infection. So my emphasis would lie on either heat or the, um, uh, um, or the vinegar. All right. Uh, well, great answer there. Um, just uh, before I uh, ask or um, uh, uh, address the uh, one question from Russell again. Uh, Mike, you asked the question about, uh, you know, fire coral. He actually got ba back and he said, thank you so much for answering. He said that his wife swam into some of this in the Red Sea. 
and it took months for the marks to disappear. And I guess that speaks to one of the slides that you had and how significant and powerful uh, or dangerous these, um, these creatures can be, you know, and, and sometimes you don't always know about it. Um, and Mike, I think you're asking, it looks like you're asking about the, uh, the hotline question or the hotline number question. Um, I will uh, just uh, give you the uh, details again. I'm going to add it into the, um, the message uh, or box there. So you should have it. Um, okay, last question for the evening before we go on to uh, the lucky draw. Again from Russell. You know, I just have to uh, compliment Russell for always being part of, um, you know, all these damn things. Uh, thanks, Russ, you know. And uh, he was on a, a talk earlier this uh, week. And uh, the two of us engage on a regular basis. And um, Franz or Dr. Cronier, you will, um, you know, a, a good friend of yours, uh, Franca Berman, who uh, took over from you and I took over from him. Uh, Russell has also been in uh, contact with him about some of the work or risk mitigation work that Franca has been doing with the hoses that, uh, you know, crumble and air quality and so forth. So thanks, uh, Russell. Anyways, let me get back to his... Um, his question, he says, for sea urchin spines embedded in uh, dermish, hot water was recommended. If I recall correctly, uh, but was about uh, mechanical breakdown, for example, repeatedly hitting, um, you know, with a, the convex side of a spoon. So, um, yeah. yes, I know that that works because I've had many of those. Um, it's most probably not the recommended way, but uh, from my experience, they definitely do work, especially those ones that go deep in, and they seem to then start festering, and you can almost squeeze them out, you know, uh, as the pus comes out. What we used to do, uh, this was a recommendation from the local Mozambican folks uh, living in the villages, is to do that or uh, just use a pawpaw and sort of wrap it around, and that sort of extracted those... Um, uh, uh, bits and pieces as they started breaking down. But that's just my experience. I'll hand over the question to you, Dr. Cronier, and, and hear what you have to say. Well, once again, you know, if, if there is um, good experience from the locals in using a particular remedy for a particular problem, mm. uh, I would heed their advice. Uh, although, you know, sometimes there's a lot of folklore that one would want to uh, check out in advance. Mm -hmm. um, papain is, uh, is the active ingredient in pawpaw that actually does the trick, but um, it is typically inferior to uh, some of some, well, heat for the deeper penetrations um, of the long spined uh, sea urchins, which are the toxic ones. Mm -hmm. The short spined ones are toxic. So heat is usually more effective as far as that is concerned, and vinegar is, is usually relatively uh, effective in terms of dissolving at least parts of the calcium uh, components of the barb. Mm. But we have sometimes found in certain envenomations where barb has entered in a particular area that you literally use a biopsy. Now, a biopsy looks... I would, I would describe it as almost like a little tube, a tube that literally cuts out um, a cylinder of skin or flesh where the barb entered. And the symptoms were only alleviated once that tract, that, that sort of pathway of the envenomation was literally excised. Yeah. So I have, I have certainly... Uh, gain a significant amount of respect mm. for how uh, troublesome some of, these, some of these envenomations can Absolutely. be. Yeah, I guess what you're saying is if it's most probably sort of more surface um, uh, injuries, then that would work. But as soon as they start going quite uh, deep into parts of the body, then, then you run sort of uh, uh, larger risks and one needs to be careful. But uh, this is one of my favorite sort of uh, stories. And um, uh, I remember before, just before joining Dan, in fact, I did some consultation work way up north in Mozambique at a place called Vermezi and Rongwe uh, Island. 
And uh, the folks that, well, they've got the resorts there now, but they were still in the process of setting it up. And uh, very interesting, I mean, these big uh, coconut crabs that would come and try, you know, steal your soap and things. And uh, at that stage, there were quite a lot of rats around, which we had to try and work uh, off the island uh, and so forth. But uh, in fact, uh, the plumber that was doing all the work for the chalets and things was a very... Um, uh, outspoken character and you know enjoyed a couple of drinks at the end of the day and but what he also enjoyed was fly fishing so um, he would obviously there was quite a lot of reef and at Bamizi for those that have been there or know about it they've got this fantastic drop off and loads of staghorn corals all around and the drop off uh, goes sort of there's about two layers that's visible or diving depth wise and then the, it drops off into that sort of continental shelf uh, to roughly about 100 meters or so maybe deeper um, so it's great you know diving all the stuff coming in but anyways he was fly fishing late afternoon and he stood on a um, what I assume was a, a stonefish or possibly a, a scorpion fish I wasn't there but it was right in the center of his foot the spine went in and uh, you know for a big man that uh, you know nice and tough he was man down so anyways there was no medication or anything available and uh, one of the chaps uh, working with us then ran into the the local village on the island um, and uh, got this old man, um, you know, I don't know, he, he looked quite strange, but eventually arrived after this chap was moaning and groaning. It was in significant pain and the swelling, just like it was unbelievable. So uh, what happened is this uh, chap brought some kind of a uh, plant-based uh, uh, material with him, and uh, he then put it into his mouth, started chewing it and, you know, calm, trying to calm um, the chap down and eventually took it. But he told us all to hold this chap down and he then thrusted whatever he chewed, the plant-based thing, right into the wound. So you could imagine the pain and this big guy, you know, he eventually just... So um, anyways, uh, we all went to sleep and we did our rounds looking after the chap. But when I woke up the next morning, both patient and doctor were um, intoxicated after spending the whole night together. The swelling was down and he could walk on his foot the next day, you know, so that was um, quite significant. Anyways, uh, Dr. Cronier, thank you for such an amazing talk. Uh, it seems like everybody really enjoyed it. Great questions from everybody that enjoyed. Uh, but before we sign off, uh, I think it's time just to do that lucky draw. So if uh, you all just hang tight, I want to copy all the names into the software that I use to do some random picking. And just to show you what's up for grabs, um, if you can see, it's this um, the Dan uh, uh, Buff. We got three of them that we're giving away. So um, <clears throat> just hang tight. Uh, let me see what I can do here. And uh, all right. All right. Three, two, one, go. Yeah, I click the button. Okay, it spat out some names here. Okay, so we've got Chantal uh, Beesler, um, Michael Winterbottom, and uh, Alexander Seeler that um, has won uh, a buff. I'll get in touch with you guys um, tomorrow to make the arrangements to get those buff to you, buffs to you guys. And, uh, you know, just thank you for all the support. I just want to see, it looks like we've got a couple of uh, people uh, just saying thank you. The talk was great and uh, all that kind of um, uh, wonderful thing. So once again, Dr. Crenier, thank you for, for a great talk. Uh, for the folks that joined, amazing to have you on board again via Zoom and uh, Facebook. And just remember, I'll make the uh, replay links available tomorrow via email. Uh, Zoom will send out things uh, on Facebook. I'll add all the links on YouTube. I'll do the same. And uh, really, I hope to see you guys in future webinars. We've got some great talks lined up uh, towards the end of um, uh, September. Uh, I've uh, invited Beth Neal, who is a four-time uh, women's uh, freediving uh, South African champion. She's doing some great work, and she's going to tell us about her, her journey as a diver and uh, all the great work she's doing. So we're looking forward to that. 
And uh, just to uh, let you know that, um, you know, I'll make all those freebies available in the form of the First Aid for Hazardous Marine Life course. And remember, we've got some great instructors out there. Russell Opland, uh, he's based in the Gauteng area. Gregory Dressel is down Port Elizabeth. And then many others around. So keep a look out for that link uh, to the Alert Divers, annual um, diving reports, uh, blog links and so forth. So, uh, oh yes, and the Hazardous Marine Life Guide, which is a nice uh, thick PDF book, so to speak. So I think you'll enjoy that. And um, yeah, just again, thank you for your support. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Dan, or if you're not a Dan member, or even if you are, please make sure that you're, uh, or to join if you're not, but if you are a member, just double check. Uh, give us a, a, a call um, even uh, send us an email or phone us and just find out whether your membership is active. Uh, I've found that quite often um, uh, our members um, think that they're still active, but, you know, they forgot about it. We do our best to try to send out emails, uh, do follow-up calls and so forth. But now that we're starting to dive again, um, you know, please make sure that you got the necessary cover in place. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've had a few divers that ran into trouble. And uh, thank goodness, uh, the great team of diving doctors and facilities that we connect with were able to help them. So uh, that was great. So just check on that. And if you want to know how to get involved uh, or join or learn more, it's our website, www.dansa.org. Um, yeah, and if you have any medical questions, I'll add that uh, um, email address to the um, to the different correspondence. It's uh, just for now. It's danmedic at danesa.org. Uh, with that said, uh, Dr. Cronier, any parting words before we uh, uh, close off for the evening? Well, just a reminder that there's also the Dan app, which. Um, uh, we found extremely useful under certain circumstances, and uh, I know, Mornay, that that's something that uh, you were really behind the development of, yeah. and it's a wonderful, it's really, really useful to communicate uh, with text sometimes, uh, because lines, telephone lines can sometimes be unclear, numbers difficult to take down, so, so just be sure, if you don't have the Dan app, uh, it's both on Android and um, on uh, iPhone, so uh, that that's on the one side. On the other side, I just want to really thank uh, the uh, uh, or the audience for staying there. I've monitored the participation, and uh, it's it's very gratifying. It's very gratifying to see that there's so much interest, and it's a privilege to be able to uh, present this material. And Mornay, thank you very much for setting it up. Thank you. Uh, that's it from our side. It's only a pleasure and uh, we'll keep it up as, as, as long as we can. Thanks for the folks. Enjoy the rest of the evening and until the next webinar. Toodles. Bye. Who do you want by your side when you go diving? A close friend? The best dive buddy available? Perhaps a guardian angel? There's someone who can be all of these things. Dan has been helping divers since 1983, when a group of passionate divers started an international non-profit medical and research organization dedicated to the health and safety of the global diving community. Where can I find Dan, you ask? Well, all over the world. Dan is an advocate for a more alert diving community and provides you with assistance every step of the way for all kinds of divers and their families. Because although we as divers want to discover the unknown, we should never do so unprotected or uninformed. That's why it's good to have someone providing you with emergency medical assistance, promoting diving safety and sharing vital diving research with you. Sometimes we all need someone to guide and protect us. When it comes to diving, that someone is Dan.